Yeah, great to see you everybody. Thank you so much for coming along. Happy Easter to you all. And I'm not sure about this front row down here. I am, I am very nervous. I'm with it. <laughs> Welcome back, guys. Hey, let's pray together and then we're going to sing. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for all that it is. It is Easter Sunday. It's Resurrection Day. It's the day that we celebrate Jesus conquering death, coming back to life, living forever. And we're here to celebrate that. We're here to worship the risen, conquering King. And thank you that so many of us are able to do that as families. Thank you for families back together. Thank you for that we're here as mums and dads and grandmas and granddads and aunties and uncles. And we're here as part of the church family, even if we haven't got any other family. Thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ. And we want to worship you together and ask, therefore, that you will help us to do that, to put all that we have into our worship this morning, to listen to what you have to say to us through the talks that we have, through the testimonies that we listen to as well. We bring this time to you and ask it be pleasing to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Music team, come and join us. I should have asked you beforehand. Our first song this morning is a great classic Easter song. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering son. Endless is the victory. You over death has won. I want to say hello to everybody on Zoom as well. I'm just clicking onto here so that I can see you all on there. Those who can't make it this morning, uh, some of you are shielding and all of those kind of things uh, whilst we're getting back together. So those on Zoom, welcome to our service this morning. Let's go. Thine be the glory. Let's stand together. And Leah is just going to go and get her Bible and come back and do our Bible reading. And as she does that, I just want to say welcome to those of you who are in church with us this morning for the first time. For those of you who are first timers in our new building here, welcome to you. We are so glad that you're part of our service this morning. So we're going to go through the Easter story. We're going to have two readings this morning. Leah is going to read our first one. And uh, if you're wanting to fi- follow along in either a paper version or on your tablet or phone or whatever, it's going to be in John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outrun Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Now we're going to do something slightly different this morning. Um, Different in the sense that uh, we're going to approach Easter slightly differently. Um, We're going to have three talks. I'm going to do two. Paul is going to do one. And we're going to look together and we're going to think because we've got all ages here, we've got children, and it's wonderful to see the children. Love having children in church with us. You're always welcome, you know that. We want to engage with you. But I think where the children graze, the adults, the old sheep, can, can get some food as well. So what we're going to do this morning, we're going to think about some of the foods that are associated with Easter. You know, we have, at Christmas, as always, you've got to have mince pies. You've got to have a Christmas cake at Easter. You have to have those. Well, at Easter, there are some things that we have at Easter. And we're going to think about those foods, the traditional foods of Easter this morning. We're going to try and understand why we have them. So my first question to you this morning is, what foods do we have at Easter? What's the first thing that you think of when we think of Easter foods? Let's see if you've got the first thing that's down on my list. Hang on, wait, hang on, mate, hang on. Wait, let's have, oh, I've got hands going up all over the place, yeah. Hot cross buns. You are right. First time. Give yourself a clap. Is that what you're going to say? You were, you're right. Good. If you were going to say something different to hot cross buns, that's probably going to come later. All right. But we're going to think to start with about hot cross buns. How many? I need to know how many people here like hot cross buns. 
All right. Um, well, the good news is we have hot cross buns. The bad news is I've only got four. Ah, oh, man alive. But these, these, these aren't just any hot cross buns. These are M&S hot cross <laughs> buns. Uh, so, I'll tell you what, um, there's lots of food afterwards, so don't spoil your appetite for the buns and the other bits of cake that we've got out there. But, I'll tell you what, can somebody do me a favour? Because I am now touching sticky hot cross buns. My hands are going to be really sticky. Could somebody just go and get me a tea towel or something that I can wipe my hands with? Um, Wait, if you know where to go, thank you. I'm going to break these up, and if anybody would like to, who would like to have a little piece of hot cross bun this morning? I'm going to break them into quarters, so that means we'll probably have eight pieces each, some big ones and some little ones. Who'd like to have a piece of hot cross bun? Any takers? Come on, come and take. I'm going to have eight. Just check with your parents first that you're allowed to have it. Right, come on. Come and get a piece of hot cross bun. Thank you, mate. Appreciate that. There we go. Right, well done, Sam. Two over here. That's one gone. Thank you. I'll, I'll tell you what, you've got a little... Are you not having any, guys? Girls? All the more for me later on. I love hot cross buns. Here we go. We've got some takers here. Fantastic. And what I want to do is find... Why do we have hot cross buns at Easter? Where did, where did the tradition start? Here we go. One each? Oh, yeah, thank you. I'm going to have yours. Yeah. So why do we why do we have where did the custom start that we have hot cross buns from? I did a little bit of research and, and I found that actually um, hot cross buns to start with had nothing to do with Easter at all. It goes back that the tradition of having hot cross buns goes back before people in this country had even heard about Jesus. So before the message of Christianity had got to to England and to Scotland and Wales and Ireland. In spring, people had a, a festival to celebrate what they thought of as the goddess of spring. And she was called Eosta. And the people uh, would kill a cow and offer the cow as a sacrifice to the goddess of Easter called Eosta. And they would also, as well as killing the cow, they would make some little buns like these. And on the top of the bun, they would put a cross, exactly as, as we have them here. And they were to represent the horns of the cow on that. So that was, that was where it came from, and that was what they did. That was before they'd heard of Jesus. And when eventually the message of Jesus came to our country and people started to believe and they realised that Jesus was way better than any of these so-called gods and goddesses that they'd sort of thought a lot of before, they started to believe in Jesus. And they thought, well, now what are we going to do with at, at Easter time? When everybody else is having their sacrifices to Yosta, what are we going to do? So they said, well, look, Rather than not do it, let's change it and we'll make it a festival to celebrate Jesus. And we will remember when Jesus died and came back to life. And that's just what they did. And they said, well, what are we going to do with these little buns? And someone somewhere had the great idea of how we probably know them, that the cross on the top is about the cross of Jesus. And so we've taken a tradition that went back before Jesus and we've given it a new meaning to remind us of the death of Jesus. And so instead of worshipping a goddess of Eosta, we now celebrate Easter. And we have the same little buns, but we have a different meaning. You probably all knew why we had the hot cross buns, but maybe you didn't know where it came from. I would say to, to the adults, you know, if you want to talk to people about Jesus, for those of you who are followers of Jesus, and you want to talk to people and create a conversation about Jesus because you want other people to know, there's a, there's a good in. Ask them if they know the, the, the history of hot cross buns. 
And then it goes on and you can carry on the conversation like I want to now for a moment and just think, well, why? What was the importance? What was the significance of Jesus dying? Because that's what we remember. That was what Good Friday on Friday was all about. It was remembering that Jesus died. Who can tell me, someone under the age of 15, why did Jesus die? What was the death of Jesus about? Anybody going to be big enough, brave enough for that? Why did Jesus die? What was it all about? Oh, come on, you're on fire this morning. Go on. Yes, he did. He died on the cross to save us from our sins. The things which we've done wrong, which, because God is perfect, right? So God can't have anything to do with anything that's not perfect. But we're not perfect. We've all done things wrong. You know, the Bible calls that the old-fashioned word, but it's sin. It's what it calls it. We've sinned. And that separates us from God. So we can't be God's friend and he can't be our friend because of the, the problem that we've got bad things in us. So Jesus came to deal with those, to take the, the punishment that should have been ours, and he died for us in our place as our substitute so that when we trust him, Jesus will take those sins away so that God can be our friend again. So when you think of hot cross buns, think of the cross. And I hope that we'll all be really grateful for the fact that Jesus died for us. So that's our first Easter food, hot cross buns. There are some others that are going to come up. We're going to sing a song before we do that. Uh, we're going to sing, see what a morning... And hopefully our music team, here they come, are going to come and lead us in this lovely song. And then I'm going to ask Emma if she will come and give our second part of the Easter story this morning. Thanks, guys. Um, reading from verse 10 to 18. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he and she told them that he had said these things to her. I sent an email around during the week and uh, was asking, what does Easter mean to you? And got a number of replies back, got three of them to show you this morning. And then I'm going to have a, a chat with Richard. Sounds ominous, doesn't it? A chat with Richard. Martin, let's have a look at uh, just a few of uh, the things that, of which Easter means to you. Right? So someone said, it's going to be easy, I've got bunting in the way here. Knowing Jesus died and rose again for me is phenomenal. That he is alive means to me I have a saviour, a friend, and a brother. And I can get through anything with him by me or in me. Wonderful. I love that. Somebody else said, it is wonderful to think that Jesus is alive today because it means he conquered sin and death and we have the hope of eternal life with him. For us also, it gives life meaning and a purpose. I wonder if that's how you feel about it this morning. You're here. I wonder if you feel like that. I wonder you know, where you find purpose and value. In, in life, I'm going to say to you that this person is right. Jesus came to bring that value. He came to bring purpose, direction, hope 
and all of that in life and in death afterwards, because that's a, that's a crucial thing. We've got to face up to the fact that one day we're we going to go through death. Are we going to rise again to be with him or not? So it gives life meaning and a purpose. And a third person said, for me, the resurrection of Jesus is a reminder of how all-powerful God is and that he can turn the very worst darkness into light. I, I think that's a really powerful thing. It's a great testimony. Because we go through some pretty black and dark times. He can turn the very worst darkness into light. That's what he did with Jesus when Jesus came back from the dead. Turned the darkness into light. It is such a comfort to know that we can turn to the living God at any time with our own troubles and to know that he is in complete control. That's great. Thank you to those of you who sent those in and, and others as well, which I haven't got time to show up this morning. But Richard, where is Richard? He's there. Come on, Richard. Um, pull you to the front this morning. And uh, he's giving him a little chance to... So, so for those of you who don't know, Richard is a farmer in the area here and been part of the church for longer than he can remember. Yeah, well, longer. almost. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. A bit like that, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, in, a, in a word, Richard, what does, what does the resurrection of Jesus mean to you? Well, it means everything, actually. But yeah. it, it started one Easter morning, I think it was 76. The last thing I planned for that Easter was to go to... Fresh Meal Baptist Chapel. Right, so it was not on the cards. No, it was, it was not, not on the cards at all, no. definitely not, no, no. Yeah, and so that Easter morning, so the day is quite a significant day for you, isn't it? Yeah, Whether it's yeah, the, the, yeah. the date in the calendar or not, it was Easter definitely morning. So, so tell, agree, us, yeah. tell us what happened that morning for well, you. Well, it, it is a completion of a journey, really. I can never remember, even as a very small child, when I was in Wales, my father died and my grandmother died. And I've got an undertaker's bill. Monday was for grandmother's funeral. And Friday was for father's funeral. And I think somewhere in that period, I don't remember anybody ever saying anything about Jesus to me, but I'm sure somebody did. Yeah. Because dad had a garage and his foreman was leaving. He'd come to see me and I was on the grass. All my toys had gone because mother was going to move back to Suffolk. And he'd just come and his wife to say cheerio and, and she was crying and he gave me this little dinky car. And as they left, my life just seemed dark. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to go with them. I, you know, mm -hmm. I got up to show, come back, take me with you. Yeah. And just then, I realised I had a father in heaven. Yeah. And he'd made me, and he made everything I see around me. He'd made, and I don't know where that come from, no one has said, but I just realised it. Yeah. But that didn't really make me a particularly nice child, I don't think, because... Uh, I was fortunate I went to Wingfield Primary School. Now, most folks wouldn't think that's a good start in life. And it probably wasn't for many things. But one thing um, that was marvellous about the place was we used to have, in the in school assembly, the teacher used to open the Bible and she gave us a Bible study every morning. Wow. Now, I decided on my first day at school that it was going to be my last. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, there were problems getting me, but I had a problem. Because I loved these assemblies. Right. I loved hearing what God said. And I just used to, it was almost like hurrying to school. That's like coming home for your favourite tea, sort of sausage and chips. You know, but you're sort of worrying on trying, and trying to get there. And I remember being like that. So that kept me at school, basically. Yep. Right. And then I met, the basic thing that happened. So all the time I was primary school, yeah, it was good. Then I come and seen those things had dropped off. But at school, I'd had a classmate called Mary. And we'd sort of hit it off on the first day. And, um, so first we, day or first date? First day. Oh, first, first day. day. Okay. She's there. She's going to go. I'll just check it. We've checking. got to see you tomorrow. No, we, we never had a date. We were mates. So, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> no, any, anyway, and the Lord was eventually to use us because uh, I drifted right away. Yeah. But I'd met Jean. And Jean used to take me to church on Sunday afternoons. I went because that kept my courting costs down. Because that was pretty <laughs> cheap. You, know, that you can tell he's a farmer, can't you? Yeah, yeah. you know. and that, I actually pr proposed to her in a graveyard. Because we used to go around and look at the inscriptions on graves. 
And I said to him, would you like my name on your grave? <laughs> and she, she jumped at the chance, you know, so that, that was brilliant. Anyway, that, and, um, and Jean became very involved with the, with the village church here. Yep. And I got really fed up with that. Yeah. I just kept landed with her to look after children. Yeah. And one night she said to me, the vicar and the church council is coming into our front room tonight. Can you clear off? So I agreed to that, but she'd be going on to me about decorating it. So the paint was there, so I drew a great big picture of a nude lady <laughs> reclining on the wall, you know. I'm a good artist. <laughs> and, I, and as I left, there was Jean and her friend trying, trying to repaint the wall. So that wasn't a good start, really. But now the thing was, we, um, Jean came and picked me up for dinner one day, and we had a fire. And uh, Jean realised she'd got all the children in the car and the oven didn't malfunction and it was set by a chip pan. Well, she'd run back and fortunately before the fire brigade got there, Peter Davison did. Because, and he threw a towel over it and put it out, but the house was completely damaged right throughout. We couldn't live in it. And I uh, went out and St Mary draws up in the Land Rover, big long Land Rover they had. And she said to me, she said, right, you're all going to come and live with me, because we couldn't live in a house that was completely shad. And I thought, well, now I'm Mary and here a long while, I don't really want to live with them. And I'm not sorry, right, Mary. And every now and then, you might think Mary's a big old softy, and she generally is. But sometimes she will drop a tone in her voice and look at you, and it really is best to do what she says. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we did. And we went, we went and I was worried, but it worked out lovely. It was probably some of the happiest time of my life in many ways. Because Mary had two children, we had so it's five young children, and we were all living in it, like Thunk and how we lived in there. But Mary and Ian, I knew it changed. I knew they were going to church. And when I was there, I could see they'd got something I hadn't got. Uh, I don't know what it was, but they definitely got something I hadn't got. And they didn't exactly pressurise me, because I used to go to work on a Sunday night, and, and I used to come back, and wow, about all the house was empty, I could have a bath. And that was sort of, you know, and they were all gone, and no pressure was, but on this... East of all they said, are you coming to church? Said, yeah. So I did. And we used to have a tiny little porch on the Baptist chapel. And I walked in it and I got a twin on each, carrying a toddler on each arm like that, and they were squirming away. And I walked in and I looked up and there used to be a sign and it said, and it was black and had italic little gold writing on it. Hmm. Well, all the pubs had one like that. Licensed to sell um, tobacco <laughs> and spirits. Well, this pub is utterly different. I noticed and it said, license to preach the gospel. Uh, and that was time or something like that. And it was exactly the same writing. And I remember looking at it, and as I looked at it, life completely changed because the Lord just came, yeah. and he was there. And I was quite, sh don't ask me, but time seemed to stand still. And he sort of looked, look, I've been with you all these years, mm. you know, when I thought that I got away with that or done that, he said, no, he was there. He got you out of that trouble. And you suddenly realise, and it's kind of embarrassing, <laughs> that the Lord yeah. was there the whole time, and that, you know, and he, and he was, you know. And that happened. And he more or less showed me that we were talking about this, and one of the things I thought about it, it was like two tracks, two railway tracks. Yeah. One yeah. of the tracks just got narrower and narrower, and darker and darker. And the other, tr other track actually widened out and he said i don't think you didn't have a choice but he said you know this is the point you are in your life you know this is where it's heading down the dark track yeah and this is the track i'm going to put you on and take you down this track and i went in and it was amazing to it i sat in the church i'd never been first real back to chapel the <laughs> last place on earth i'd ever planned on visiting i must admit i would never come in a lovely old place you know. it looked a lot better when we left it and it did in those days i can see but um, I went in and I sat down in the pew and it just felt like I knew I was at home. Right. Before I joined other clubs, I could never really get into it. It was just a bit of me from back. Yep. But here, that was just a great feeling of being home. Yeah, wonderful. And then the pastor got up and preached and it was just like, I was back, listening yep. to the gospel. Yeah. It was lovely. It's fantastic. Yeah. So that, yeah, yeah I mean, there's, there's more to this story. We'll, co we'll come back to it. Oh, on another. Oh, oh, oh excellent. <laughs> <laughs>
But Richard, thank you for that. It was that was Easter morning, and God just revealed Himself, yeah, and that was the day. It's yeah. like a spiritual resurrection for you. Yeah, standing like this, and yeah, that wasn't my plan at all. Oh, wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to ask Paul to come and take us through the next, the next bit of Easter food. I wonder what it is. Yeah, okay, we're going to be thinking about the best one of all we're going to have this morning. Easter egg. I'll just pop it there. But what I want to do is I, I just want to focus on the children here this morning. And, uh, no, joking. and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I want you to try and guess, children, what's in this egg, okay? There's something in this egg. You hear that? Yeah? What do you think's in that egg? Put your hand up if you know. You hear that? I'll just come a bit nearer. Can you hear that? What's in that? It's an egg. You think it's an egg inside the egg, do you? Yep. Okay, John, we'll go with that. Anyone else? What's in there? Yeah. Sweets. And you're hoping that you're right, and I'm going to open up and give them to you, yeah? <laughs> yeah. A stone. Yeah, maybe. Yep. Okay, Arthur. I'll come to you, Caleb, in a minute. A smarty. Okay, maybe. Smarties. Yep. Okay. Caleb? Chocolate. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Anyone else want to give one more guess? Shall we have a look inside? And whatever's in there, you can have it, yeah? Yeah? Okay, let's have a look. Okay, you ready? Nothing. Ooh. He's a magician. <laughs> There's nothing. It's empty. You're all wrong. <laughs> all right, boys, just go with it, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing inside. It's a bit strange, isn't it? You all thought there was like a Smarty or a, or a chocolate or something like that in there. It kind of, this kind of reminds me of Easter. It reminds me of Easter. I mean, Stuart, the other week at school assembly, talked about how there's nothing in an Easter egg anymore. You have to, it's outside of it. and It's a bit disappointing. But what happened at Easter? The, the women went to the grave to see Jesus... They thought he was going to be there, didn't they? They thought there was someone in the tomb, and there wasn't. It was empty. There was nothing in the tomb. And so they were surprised, more surprised than you are this morning. There's nothing in that egg, even though you heard something in there. Yeah? <laughs> but what does it mean that Jesus wasn't in the tomb anymore? What does that mean to you and me this morning? What it means is that everything Jesus promised is true. Every single thing that Jesus promised and said he would do and did for us, it means it's true. Because he's not dead, he's alive. And if we believe and we, and we trust Jesus, it means because he's alive, he is able to forgive our sins. If we trust and believe Jesus, he's alive. It means that he will always help us. And if we trust and believe in Jesus, because he's alive, it means he will always love us. Isn't that wonderful? And that might be something that we all need to hear this morning, and not just the children. Because the resurrection of Jesus changes absolutely everything. And I just think it was great hearing Richard's story. I've lost track of where Richard is. But I was uh, of hearing Richard's story because he couldn't believe that he ended up in a church listening to the story of Jesus and thinking, that's what I need. Mm. And I just want to say to, to anyone, or all of you this morning, that... That solution that you're searching for, that thing that you're aiming for, that you think is going to make your life complete, it might do for a bit, but it won't really, because it's a poor substitute for Jesus. 
because anything that we strive for and aim for is merely a poor substitute because you can't get better than a risen saviour who died and rose again for you and me, can you? So anything else is a poor substitute. So let's fix our eyes on Christ this morning. Thank you for listening. Okay, let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for this glorious morning. Thank you for Jesus, for his work, Lord, for us. We so often, Lord, we focus on the wonder of the cross, Lord, rightly so. But it's all made possible, Lord, because he is alive and not dead. And it's the greatest story ever told. And we give you, we give you so much thanks and praise, Lord, this morning for your incredible uh, plan, Lord, for your incredible purpose that you have, Lord, for each of our lives and for the opportunity, Lord, that lies in front of each one of us because you've invited everyone, Lord, to come and know you. So we thank you, Lord, for your love that is wider than our world, Lord, deeper than the, the greatest ocean, Lord, Father, we just rejoice at your wonderful goodness and mercy to us, Lord. And as we do, Lord, we, we just remember, Lord, those, those people that uh, uh, Peter's just mentioned. We thank you for a new life, and we, we just pray, Lord, for, mm-hmm. for health over both of them right now, Lord, um, and for safe deliveries of their babies, Lord. And uh, for those first few weeks, Lord, will you, will you strengthen them and bless them, Lord? And we thank you for them both, Lord. And we, we just want to join with you, Lord, and thank you uh, for, for families, Lord, for friendships. Thank you, Lord, for all those things that we enjoy, Lord. We live our life, Lord. Life is good when relationships are good. And uh, so, Lord, we thank you and we pray that in Jesus, Lord, we will find the the, the greatest relationship, Lord. Uh, And we would know that even more fully, Lord, even better, Lord, this morning than we do already. And so, Lord, just accept what we bring to you this morning, Lord. We lift our hearts up to you, and we say thank you, Lord, for all that you have done and for all that you are going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. There is one other food that we haven't done yet for Easter. So we've done hot cross buns, done Easter eggs. There's another one that I always think of at Easter. I wonder whether you do the third one as well. I know someone said to me, Never heard of it this morning when I was talking to him beforehand. Caleb, are you going to have a guess? Not roast. We could have done roast lamb because that's often done, but I haven't got any roast lamb with me right now, unfortunately. It's in the oven at home. Um, I'll show you. I'll show you what it is. I wonder. Here's one we did earlier. Well, we bought earlier. It's called a Simnel cake. How many of you know about Simnel cakes? Ah, right. Well, we're going to have a good lesson this morning. Of those of you who know about Simnel cakes, how many of you like Simnel cake? That is really good news because I absolutely love Simnel cake. It is just about my favourite. Martin, thank you. So there you go. You can see the big picture of this. Had I known that my son was going to bring us home a Simnel cake... I would have brought that along this morning and you could have seen it and tasted it, except you couldn't because it was a, probably twice the size of this and it's half gone already and that came home on Saturday. Let me tell you, so Simnel Cake, I'll tell you where it started and why it's all around Easter and what it's kind of made of. Um, it's got nothing to do, it had nothing to do with Easter. 
It's like hot cross buns. When Simnel cakes started around Easter, and for some of you it's never started, well, I hope for your sake, particularly if you're a marzipan lover, I hope that it will start, because otherwise we're going to have to have words. You need to get into Simnel cakes. They are lovely. The custom of making these little cakes started years ago when in the days... Um, kind of maybe when your grandmas or great grandmas or great grandmas for children, great great grandmas, when young girls, when they got to about 11, they would often leave home and go to work in one of the big houses in the countryside and they would help with the cleaning. So when they're about 11, hands up if you're 11 this morning. Anybody here who's 11? Right, we've got an 11. So imagine, Sam, you, if, if, when your age, the girls would leave home and they would go to work in a big house and they would have to help with the cleaning. They'd have to help with making the beds. They would have to make the fires because they didn't have central heating in those days. We're talking a long time ago when Peter was a little boy where they would have to help with the washing and the ironing and all of those kind of things, the things that made homes work. And they lived in these big houses. And they didn't get home to see their mums and dads very often, because that's where they lived. One Sunday a year, they were allowed to go home. They would all go home. And that was on Mothering Sunday. So on Mothering Sundays, the girls would go home to see their mums. And when they went home, they would take them a present. They would take them a fruitcake. And they would decorate it. So they'd go home to see their mum with a fruitcake, but there was a problem. Mothering Sunday is always in the middle of Lent. And in those days, you weren't allowed to eat fruitcake in Lent. So they would keep the fruitcake until Lent finished. And on Easter day, they would get the cake out that the daughter had brought for them several weeks before, and they would eat it. And that was the origins of a Simnel cake. Now, the thing on the picture here, you can see the thing with a Simnel cake is it's got marzipan on the top, and I think this is why I like it. What you can't see is it also has marzipan in the middle, and I need to check this one here. So if you haven't had a marzipan, bef uh, haven't had a piece of Simnel cake, we'll have this available afterwards, and I'm going to see. It should have marzipan in the middle as well, if it's a proper one. And it has. So running through the middle is a layer of marzipan. So we'll save that one for later. And on the top were the little balls of marzipan. I'm being really good and disciplined and not eating it. I absolutely love marzipan. On the top, now, can you count how many little bowl, balls of marzipan are on the top? Count them carefully. How many are there? Caleb's got his hand up. He's done it. How many are there, Caleb? Mm, have another look. <laughs> How many did you get, Samuel? You got 11. Who else got 12? Who else got 11? Good. There are 11 little balls of marzipan on the top. And what those little balls of marzipan came to represent were the apostles, the disciples, the followers of Jesus who stayed true to him at Easter. Remember, Jesus had 12 best friends. We called them the disciples or the apostles. One of them was called Judas. And Judas was the one who betrayed Jesus. He was the one that gave Jesus over to the horrible Romans with a kiss. He kissed him. That was the secret sign. And on the top are 11 little bits of marzipan. And they represent the disciples, the apostles, that stayed true to Jesus. They believed in him. Even though things went wrong, they stuck with him. They didn't get it right. They, they were sad. They were disappointed. They didn't know that he was going to come back to life until the, on the Sunday they were together and they saw Jesus. And then Thomas got to see with them. You have to read the whole story in the Bible. But that's what the marzipan blobs are for. They represent, they remind us of the people that stayed true to Jesus. And I think that's a really good lesson for us at Easter. Because we talk about the death of Jesus, the hot cross buns. We get reminded of the, the empty tomb with the Easter egg on 
Easter as well, the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus coming back to life. But the simnel cake asks us a question. Do we believe in Jesus or not? Do we follow him or not? Do we trust him or not? And this is a question for all of us this morning. Some of the stuff we've talked about is right round, hopefully, where the children can understand. Grown-ups, this is, this is, I want you to think about this one. What do you think of Jesus this morning? That this good, wise teacher, this man who did miracles, this man who could speak to the wind and the wind would stop, this one who could speak to illness and the illness would disappear, this one who could speak to dead people and make dead people come back to life. This one, Jesus, who was put into a tomb, who was killed and put into a, into a grave and came back to life again. The one who died on the cross for our sins and suffered the wrath of God, the punishment of God. The one who came back to life again afterwards. I want to ask you this morning, all of us, what do we think of Jesus? Are we, if you're a blob of marzipan, so this is not meant as an insult, But if you were a blob of marzipan, would you be on the simnel cake or not? Would you be there? Or would you be absent? What do you think of Jesus? It is Jesus who offers offers us hope and purpose in life. He's the one that can put broken things back together again. He is the one when we start to follow him and do things his way, we'll will bring broken relationships and struggling relationships and will give them hope in the future. He is the one that, as we follow him, can help sort out the issues of life and and ourself and how we see ourselves. Follow Jesus and it will help get things, even things down to finances sorted out when we do things his way. When we follow Jesus, it makes a difference at every level. I'm not saying it takes away every problem. I'm not saying that you follow Jesus and everything will be right. But what I am saying is that what we see in the Bible and what we see in history and what somebody like Richard would say is when you start to follow Jesus, it helps you even through the difficult times. And crucially, it gives us hope afterwards. It is through Jesus that we get right with God and have the promise of an eternity that is wonderful beyond our wildest dreams. An eternity of unimaginable delight and pleasure. It is through Jesus only that we get to heaven. I want to read to you, as we just draw to a conclusion, some words of one of my favourite passages. There's a guy called Sam Storms, and, and he describes heaven like this. I can't imitate his accent but he's got a wonderfully poetic way with words I'm going to read you this is what he said when we get to heaven there will be nothing there that is abrasive irritating agitating or hurtful nothing harmful or hateful or upsetting or unkind when we get to heaven there will be nothing sad bad mad There will be nothing impatient, ungrateful and unworthy. Nothing that is weak and sick or broken or foolish. Nothing that's deformed, degenerate, depraved or disgusting. Nothing that's polluted, pathetic, poor or putrid. Nothing that's dark or dismal, dismaying or degrading. Nothing blameworthy or or blemished. Nothing blasphemous or blighted. Nothing faulty, faithless, failing or frail. Nothing grotesque, grievous, hideous or insidious. Nothing illicit or illegal, lascivious or lustful. Nothing marred or mutilated, misaligned or misinformed. Nothing nasty or naughty, offensive or odious. Nothing rancid rancid or rude, soiled or spoiled. Nothing tawdry or tainted, tasteless or tempting. Nothing that's vile or vicious, wanton or wasteful. So none of those things... And then he goes on to say what will be there. Get this. Wherever you turn your eyes, there'll be nothing but glory and grandeur and beauty and brightness and purity and perfection and splendor and satisfaction and sweetness and salvation and majesty and marvel and holiness and happy. 
we will see only and all that is adorable and affectionate, beautiful and bright, brilliant and bountiful, delightful and delicious, delectable and dazzling, elegant and exciting, fascinating and fruitful, glorious and grand, gracious and good, happy and holy, healthy and whole, joyful and jubilant, lovely and luscious, majestic and marvellous, opulent and overwhelming, radiant and resplendent, splendid and sublime, sweet and savoury, tender and tasteful, euphoric and unified. What won't be there, what will be there? If you remember any of those, I just think that paints a wonderful picture of what we have as the followers of Jesus to look forward to. All the things that make life sad and bad, will not be there. And because Jesus died and rose again, when we put our trust in him, we have that wonderful place to look forward to. So I ask you the question again. Are you, gonna, are you on that seminal cake? Is your blob there? Or are you away? Have you fallen away like Judas? My prayer is that we'll be those who accept him and love him and follow him and stay with him come thick or thin, rather than be those that walk away and leave him and continue to put ourselves first. Judas despaired in life. We don't have to. Judas despaired in life. You don't have to. Because in Jesus, there is newness, there is freshness, there is forgiveness, and there is wholeness as you come to him. This Easter time, hopefully as we've gone through Hot cross buns, Easter eggs, and simnel cake. Simnel because that's the kind of flower I've got to tell you that. It's just the name from the flower. The simnel cake, the lessons learned. It gives us something to think about, and it causes us to think, where are we with Jesus? Have we got his hope and his joy in our hearts? If you haven't and would like it on the table, as you go out on the left in, before, in front of the main doors, there's some little red booklets called Why Jesus? You can do two things if you'd like to know Jesus. Well, there's three things you can do. You can pray in your heart right now. As we're going to sing our last song, music team, come and join us. As we sing, you can pray in your own heart and ask Jesus to forgive you and to come into your life and to be your friend and to be your saviour. You can give yourself to trust him and follow him. And so enter into this life as you follow him. You can do that right now. You could come and speak to me or Paul and we would love to explain a little bit more to you if you want a little bit more information. Or the third thing you can do, just take one of those little booklets and read it through. It explains all that you need to do. And at the end, there's a little prayer that you might want to pray of repentance and faith in Jesus. But here is Easter, the death and the resurrection and the call for us to follow him and be loyal to him. On resurrection day, my question to you is what do you think? of Jesus. Let's finish with a song. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his hands, his wounds, his feet, my saviour on that cursed tree. Music starts, let's stand and sing our last song. awesome, incredible love to us. We thank you for the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we lift him up today yeah. as our Lord and our Saviour. In his name we proclaim, Amen. 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 Thank you so much for coming this morning. Please take your seats. Refreshments are going to be served out there. There's a whole load of Easter eggs for grown-ups, little tiny ones. Save the bigger ones for the children. Children, don't forget to get your Easter eggs. If you're around tonight, come and join us back here, if you like, at 6 o'clock. We've got some great old songs and a couple of really good new ones as well, and a couple of media clips to see, and we're going to have a, a look at God's Word as well. Paul's going to minister the Word tonight. So if you're around and can come back on Easter Day, you are very, very welcome. But if not, then go and enjoy the rest of the day, and God bless you. If you live in the area and don't normally go to church anywhere, you are very welcome to come and join us here on any Sunday. All right, God bless you.